Hello and good morning. Welcome to the Battle Speech Warpoint. My name is Bracha Batmira Vishlomo, and we have a series of amazing bards from across the society to share this spoken word warpoint with you today, featuring a rousing pre battle speech for your kingdom or alliance, or a battle story performed by the person involved in the battle, be that combatant, martial, water bearing, or anything else. These are original works only. Uh, we are very excited to get started and kicking us off, we have Grim the Scald of the East Atlantia Alliance performing The Five Who Stood. Take it away. Good morning. I am Louder Father Grim the Scald of the East Kingdom uh, and I am going to perform for you today a true story from Penzik 38. Uh, I know I was there, I was at this place. The best tales tell of a few men who stand against many foes and yield not. I offer you the word fame of five who stood. At one gauge in a great wall that parted the Penzik field, fierce tigers tore the dragon who charged back, breaking the line. Cleft land spears split the East men, dark moon swords drove in after. When this charge had wounded the East, five tigers in fight remained. White and green wore four of these, the blazon of their bold household. Noble Carl, quiet but fierce, belly fish with blazing sword, Constantine of kingly blood at his side, eager Durkin. The fifth man, a famed master, Duke Randall, the dark spearman. Tiger's kin, enclosed by swords, stood bravely, braced against their foe. Bold Gunnar, battle maker, hailed the five fierce defenders. If you men yield us the gate, we'll offer you honor in single fights. Defer to us. You'll not fall against fruitless odds. Courage showed Karl Mirstapa. He hailed back, to hell with that. We'll not yield without battle. We'll fight you to own this gate. Gunnar laughed and loudly said, well spoken. He spurred his men forward to the five tigers. Great, but brief battle followed. Though these five fell to a man, they fought till their final breath. Eager they to Odin went. Valhall's field they fight in now. Thank you so much. That was really, really wonderful. Next. Hi, my name is Master Adam Komen, and this is my entry for the NS There I Was Bardic Warpoint. Okay, strictly speaking, we were in the Shire of Ravens Lake, which only borders North Shield, but since North Shield had only just stopped being a mid-realm principality when the story happened, I think it counts. Anyway, this is the story of charging the Rivaldo. I need to clear up a few things about the Rivaldo. The first is that this is a rapier story, and our ranged weapons in melee are almost always rubber band guns, which use a piece of surgical tubing that flies in a mostly straight line for maybe five, maybe 15 yards and lands with enough of a thwack that you'll feel it even when you're distracted by all the swords in front of you. This works at pistol size. It's not much different at rifle size. And the Rivaldo is not that? It's one of those Leonardo da Vinci creations, kind of like his tank, which North Shield built and brings to Gulf Wars, which I suppose is another North Shield There I Was story, even though that one happens in Glenavon and that story isn't this story, this is the story about the Rivaldo. Not all of you have met the Rivaldo. The Rivaldo was proposed about 1480, page 157 of the Codex Atlanticus and stands about the size of a wheelbarrow with 14 barrels spread in a 30 degree arc. 
The RBG Rivaldo was built in 2004, stands about the size of a wheelbarrow, and has seven lengths of pipe, three feet long, each of which holds two rubber bands, also stretched three feet long. The whole thing fires at once from a single trigger point strong enough to handle 14 stretched bands of surgical tubing. You should probably ask how much force is contained by 14 stretched bands of surgical tubing. To quote from Master Kevin O'Shaughnessy, who built it, I don't know, but those 14 bands can pick up a 100-pound woman without any significant stretch. And that is what I charged at full speed. We're almost there. So Kevin rolled out the Rivaldo for an open field battle where we were vastly outgunned even before it showed up. This monstrosity that fires 14 shots 35 yards downfield in a 30 degree arc of destruction in a game where we'd established there wasn't going to be any res and my team was already down in points. And I knew that they knew that I was team captain, and that meant I was prime target for every single gun they had. And I knew the Rivaldo was going to wreak psychological havoc as long as it wasn't fired. And I knew that if I ran up to the Rivaldo, I could block all the shot and keep my team from being torn to shreds. Okay, I guessed that one, but it sounded smart in the 10 seconds the marshal gave me to come up with a plan before lay on. Turns out, 10 seconds just enough time to assign and abandon a second in command. Sorry about that. Nor shield, there I was running right for her southern border, full on, total charge, straight down the center of the field, straight towards Kevin at three paces away from the Rivaldo. Kevin still hadn't fired. I wondered whether he would hold his fire until he got somebody to finish me off while I was dancing in front of the gun. This would ruin the plan. I also realized I was still moving at full speed and even as I started to put on the brakes, it was obvious I would blow through their line before I could stop, because you don't get to attack at a dead run during rapier melee, usually. At two paces, Kevin fired the gun. Seven barrels, 14 bands, stretched three feet each, and I caught almost all of them in the belly. Not nearly as much of a sting as you might have expected, to be honest. At one pace, goodness, I was still moving awfully fast. I hoped Kevin wouldn't mind if I used his gun as a brace. Besides, it would look cool if I draped myself over the gun in mock vivisection. Kevin likes when things look cool. I mean, he built the Rivaldo. In hindsight, I admit that my melodramatic death may have slightly traumatized the gun crew when I splayed myself across the top while my momentum rocked the rig backwards about three inches and I uttered a noise more or less like, Ugh, trying to sell the moment. And I learned that I didn't catch all 14 shots because one of the three that got past me killed my second in command. Figures. So the next time that I charge the Roboto, I'm bringing my buckler. Thank you. Thank you so much and for covering through my technical difficulties as well. So you were magnificent on all accounts. And I love the story as well. All right, that was fantastic. Next up, we have Tiern Bard of the Western Alliance coming with the piece, The Taking of the Easter War Banner, Penzik 13. All right, and you are up. Take it away. There was a mistake there. It wasn't the Easter War Banner, it was the Eastern War Banner. And I looked back and it was actually Penzik 14. It happened to be my third Penzik War, the first one where I was actually old enough to fight. And I was lucky enough to be squired to then Viscount Sir Aaron Breck Gordon, who had just become King of Meridies. Now, Aaron and I were both Trimerians, and Trimeris was still a principality, Meridies. But Trimeris, even though farther away from Penzik War than the rest of Meridies, was far more ornaments and those kind of fun things. Whereas we like to beat people up in big battles. So the Meridian war host, which about 30 fighters, 25 of which were Tremarian, all went off to Penzik war. Now, I said Tremarians were kind of barbaric according to the Meridians. In fact, they called us swamp lords, which we took as a name of honor. 
but that also meant that because we were barbarians, we could get along with other barbarians like the two chucks. And so we would often go up and actually dance and sing and play with the two chucks. And in fact, my knights are the leader of the two chucks. And so one Am I back? Okay. So one evening before the war had actually started, two chucks and Aaron and a couple of select squires went off to have his internet and uh, have a meeting with. Now, Wolf himself did not speak in this meeting. His shop. Aaron went up there and and drawing in the sand and the dirt in front of the wolf with his little saying a sign, draw a kind of a, a map of what the Eastern uh, Penzik war woods battle looks like, kind of what their strategy normally was. For anyone who hasn't been to the Penzik woods battle, there's a river along one side, runs right along next to the river, and it goes way up into the back and then you climb some hills, now you're up into some clearings and stuff up at the top of the hills. You can also go around the back way up the hills and there's a bunch of clearings along the top of the hill. Now between all these clearings and this path, swampy woods, dense stuff that pretty much nobody went through except the two woods stuff. And nobody went through there because the two checks were variants and they would jump out of trees on people. But Aaron made this deal with the two chucks. And so with this deal in place, we went down to the woods battle. Now, Eastern War Banner was being that they were, Easter was defending the war year. And so they marched off with their war banner all off into the woods with all of their allies. As soon as they were, well, Meridiers, but mostly Tamaris, we all put on mid realm war band, uh, surcoats that we had made the night before quickly painted surcoats. And we, when the cannon run, went right down, straight down the pathway next to the river, which is the normal mid-realm uh, strategy. Just fight all. The backyard where the banner usually is. This time, okay, and fight their way Charge straight down the thing wearing mid realm banners and just charge, 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 fought, 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 fought until we all died. We went back to Resurrection Point, took off our sword coats, and then set off through the woods and the swamps and the yucky stuff in the middle of the woods battle that nobody went through. We did see a two chucks, some even in trees, but because we'd made a deal, nothing happened. And so we just slogged our way through the swamps and the trees and the bushes and the vines and finally climbed our way out. And we ended up in a clearing about 15 foot from the Eastern War Banner. So we quickly rushed out, took, only had a small guard there, took the War Banner. And Aaron turned to uh, Duke Merriwald and said, take the banner, go. I don't want to know where you go. And so Merriwal and five of us, which ended up including the, the Prince of Tremeris, Prince Shosai, ran off into the woods with the war banner. Meanwhile, Aaron took everyone else up there and they pretended like they were still protecting the banner. And they're like, shit, protect the banner, protect the banner. And they formed up up there. We ran off through the woods and the swamps and the vines and the trees and ended up down in the action river of Pensick. Or recapture the banner. And they're 
running by 15, 20 foot from us behind a little shield of some, some bushes and trees and stuff. We could kind of see them go by, but they didn't notice that we were walking right there in the middle of the river with the war banner. So we're walking with the war banner for a while when the herald that goes with the war banner pointed out that it was about getting time for we had to plant it. And so we double checked, we have to have a, a 15 foot wide clearing, right? Yeah, it has to be 15 foot wide clearing. Well, the river happened to be about 15 foot wide at that spot. And so we planted the banner there in the middle of the river. Marshall said, I guess that's not really what they intended, but technically it works, so that's it. Now, I mentioned Prince Shosai came with us. Shosai wore this bright white and blue garb and this big chrome helmet with big white and blue peacock feathers and stuff on top. And so we put him in the center, right next to the banner, and the rest of us kind of gathered around him to block that, all that brightness. And we sat there in the water, in the stream, as force after force went running within 15 foot of us, go get the banner, retrieve the banner, guard the banner, everyone just running right past us. And we sat there for, oh, 45 minutes, an hour, I don't know. Just sat there in the water. Eventually, we hear a cannon go off, hogging our way out of the river. The banner was until we came climbing out of the water and showed up, and yes, we indeed had the Eastern War Banner. And we took it up to our royal camp, build a camp. And the Eastern King sent some of his people to come get it. And we told him no, he could have it back in war court. And we held on to the Eastern War Banner until the end of final court of Pensac War. Now, they left us sitting outside, the six of us that had, had the banner, outside for the entire All right, it looks like our contestant is having some internet problems right now. So we are going to move on along our list and hopefully we can get him back when his internet returns. Oh, it looks like he is coming back on to finish his tale for us. Just yes, in thank time. You. <laughs> Excellent, please, please carry on. I was enraptured. <laughs> The end of the and it came to the end of court, and they never called us, and they actually started to process out. So, in front of the king of the east, and his war banner at his feet, and I became very loquacious, and he pointed out that. This war, this Pentic War, was no longer just the East versus the Middle. When a force fought the woods, they needed to acknowledge that their allies were perhaps a little more important than they used to think. And so that was our taking of the Eastern War Banner. And as far as I know, that uh, little piece of the Eastern War Banner is still around the hilt of my sword. That's all I had to say. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much for that. And I think you might have a bit of a battle story coming out of your time here as well. Thank you so much for both your story and your determination to see the story through. I commend you on both of those things. All right. So next we have Count Baldrick Lehman of Newcastle Emlyn of the East Atlantia Alliance. 
coming with the piece, The Day I Took On the Rogan Mountains. Are you ready? I am. You are. Fantastic. Please take it away. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is uh, Baldur Klingman of Newcastle Emlyn from Eldermere. And I would tell a tale. I would tell a tale that took place some 25 years ago when I was but a strapping young lad at 25. And I would laugh because the old days with Rogan and Penzik War back in the day, the campsites were relatively different than they are now. And that year, the Harogan managed to cap camp at the top of the hill. Now, the Harogan was a mid-realm slash Eldamir household that are still around today, but their leader was Thorbjorn Osis, who was Thor personified, as it were, a giant mountain of a man, and his squires were no less so. And early on in my days, this was my very first Penzik, I was very excited to go, and the only thing I loved more than fighting back then was drinking, and I did both in equal supply at that Penzik. And I had arrived in the Harogan camp because I had been speaking to my brethren there and we discussed you know going up and doing pickups on the battlefield and you know getting more prepared for battle i arrived in camp and also was sitting around the campfire with his squire redmond and it was a, a nice quiet morning and i said boss it's time to go fight where are the boys and he arched his thumb and said they're in the barracks behind me which was a giant white pavilion and so i went wandering into the pavilion right next to the door was a chin now a chin was a large man six foot six, monstrous shoulders, big barrel chest. And I jumped on him. I sat on his chest. I shook his shoulders. I banged his head on his pillow. I shook his face back and forth and said, it's time to get up. It's time to get up. Let's go fight. And he threw me off him like a discarded blanket. Uh, pretty sure one handed. I looked in the corner and there was Worgen. Now a chin was large. Worgen was perhaps larger. And so I jumped onto Worgen because I know no fear. And I grabbed Worgen's head and I bounced it off his pillow and I shook his shoulders and I bounced up and down on his chest and I tried to drag him up and he would have none of it. And again, flung me off him like I'm a discarded blanket. So not to be unduly you know, disturbed from my, my process, I moved back to a chin. As I began to work my way back to a chin though, I felt a hand on my ankle and it was not a hand. It was a shackle. It was full on strong, strong hand. And I looked back and realized Worgen planned on punishing me for my transgressions. Now, Worgen weighed 300 pounds, I think, 350 maybe. A big, massive man. I weighed uh, 150 pounds and I knew fear for the first time. And so I decided in my tactical thinking, the ground is hard, the chin is not as hard. So I lunged for a chin's leg and began to crawl up a chin, thinking to myself, if Worgen's going to crush me, he's going to crush a chin more. So I began to work my way up. A chin was haphazardly sort of kicking me away and looked up and suddenly realized the peril. His eyes got this big and the fight began anew. So he began to try to fight away from me. He was trying to drag his way out of the tent and I was climbing up a chin going, no, I don't want to do this. As I'm slowly working my way up his body, Worgen is slowly working his way up mine. And a chin has made it towards the edge of the tent and he reaches out the door of the tent and he reaches towards Osis and he reaches his hand out and says, boss, boss, help me. And Osis looks over, glances back, reaches over and closes the tent flap. At that moment, a Chen knew his defeat. At the last moment, I lunged forward and managed to plant myself upon a Chen. At the last moment, Worgen le leaned forward and planted himself on top of me. A Chen, like a discarded tube of toothpaste, is groaning from the bottom. Worgen, on top of us both, laughing giant guffaws. Ha, 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 ha. Every time he ha, a Chen goes, Ugh! and I giggle like a four-year-old schoolgirl. It's incredible fun, and I won that battle for sure because I survived. Thank you. Thank you so much for that riveting story. That was absolutely fantastic, um, as well as deeply entertaining. Thank you for that very much. So coming up next, 
we have Conde Fernando Rodriguez de Falcon of the Middle Alliance coming with a piece, What Matters. After that is Hauk of the East Atlantic Alliance. So Conde Fernando Rodriguez de Falcon, are you ready? I am, thank you very much. Fantastic, please take it away. I'm Conde Fernando from Calentir. Um, get ready. I don't know who's shouting, but it doesn't matter. My body reacts. My shoulder pushes into my shield to brace the wall and my hands lock tight around my sword. Get ready might not tell you much, but here and now it's all I really need. With just minutes left in the battle, I know the enemy will be throwing everything they can at the banner just a few feet behind me. It's a terrifying thought, but it just doesn't matter. No matter how badly we outfought our foes for the first 59 minutes of this fight, we could lose it all to a single well-tarmed charge just before the cannon. And that's a tactic the East has proven to expert at over the years. But I can't see them forming up. To the front, my vision is totally blocked by a wall of metal. And to the right, the only way I can turn by the back of my shield brother and the legs of a great sword been standing over me. But that doesn't matter either. It just means I'm not alone. I'm in the Calentir line. My mouth is dry. Thank God the water bears made me drink at each res. Still, I'm parched, damn near exhausted. But none of that matters. Suddenly the sounds of battle change. There's a rumble and a roar and a score of shouting voices. And beneath that scutum, it gets darker as a second rank leans over, blocks out the sun. It's coming. We're about to be slammed into by 50 or more men determined to kill us, to crush us, to push us back. All hell's about to break loose. And that sure as hell matters. Adrenaline kicks in and I smile. I'm ready. I'm kneeling there behind the wall staring at Sir Eric's kneecap, my hand locked around my scutum handle, the pommel of my sword shoved against the corner of my shield, braced hard. How far are we from the banner? I call out. 12 feet comes the answer. Damn, our scutum line just isn't very wide. If the charge comes in from the left or the right, it'll bypass our wall. It'll be able to get to the banner without serious opposition. But there's no time for me to worry about that. Get ready, comes the call again. And there's no time to think of anything else. It just doesn't matter. I'm trapped in the moment and the enemy is coming. I lean into my shield, my clans clench so tightly, they instantly start to cramp. Every muscle in my legs burning. I can't hold this position for long, but it just doesn't matter. I won't have to. The roar of the charge carries down to me. Can I stop them? Wrong question. Can we stop them? Because that's what matters. I feel the scooter to the left from the pressure on the edge of my shield. And Sir Eric is there as he steps even closer to my shield. Another body pushes in the back of my head, getting closer to the wall. We're ready, but our wall still isn't wide enough. Suddenly friends are there. Our brothers in the outlet are already standing in our ranks as they have so many times before. But the Sable Star of Osteora moves up and covers our left. And somehow Eldemir, the second of the Mid-Realm's three sons, has stepped up and guarded our right and all that matters. Can we stop them? Damn straight we can stop them. A second later, my scutum is slammed into and I'm shoved back. My shield is now shoved into an angle closer to the ground, pushing the men behind me back a full step. Thank God I was braced, I think. But before I could do more than just start to push my scutum back upright, another far more powerful charge crashes into our line like the hammer of God. I'm crushed down into a narrow wedge between my shield and the ground. It's all I can do to hold against the awful pressure as the thunder of her tan washes down from above. If I'm knocked over, I'll have no hope of getting back up and there'll be a hole right in the center of our wall heading straight for the banner. Support, I shout as I desperately push up on my scutum. I can't move it. Adrenaline is all that gives my exhausted body the strength to hold. Hours, or maybe just seconds pass. Time seem to stretch out as our pole arms and swords swing into our foes. I can hear them, my position, I can't see anything. Can anyone hear me? Is anyone still there? Support, I call. My arm can't hold me up much longer. My back can't take this. Support. Panic starts to well up. Support, I crawl again. That's it, I'm done. My arm starts to buckle. I'm going over any second. I've been abandoned. Clang. A kneecap slams to the back of my scutum next to my face. And Sir Eric's leg takes up part of the strain. Oh, sweet relief. I'm not alone. Of 
course I'm not alone. I might just hold on. Together we push the shield up a few more precious inches. I'm not going anywhere. I can see more of my comrades now. We're not going anywhere. More weapons crash overhead and each impact seems to say, this is our ground. Suddenly there's a loud boom and the final cannon sounds. In a heartbeat it's over. And time speeds back up as the weight of the Eastern Army is finally removed from our scutum line and my shield. The sheer pressure the enemy charge would push me and our entire wall back almost six feet, but they didn't break through. We still hold the banner. A minute later, word comes that victory in the battle is ours. And that victory is so sweet. But really, that's not what matters. What matters is that our spears, our poles, our shields, our great swords, our water bearers and our allies worked together that day to hold the line. I was never alone. And that's what I'll remember. That's what matters. Thank you. Thank you so, so much for that. That was truly fantastic. And truly we are never alone, even when we have to be apart during these very tough times. Thank you so much for that. That was riveting. All right. So coming up next, we have Hauk of the East Atlantia Alliance with the piece A Grizzly Supping. Coming after Hauk, we have Lord Donalbane of Black Marsh. So right now we are looking forward to hearing what Hauk has in store for us. Are you ready? Trying to be. Oh, there you are. Fantastic. All right. Take it away. And you can hear me? Yes. Coming through loud and clear. My brothers and sisters, storytellers, we have heard tales of wondrous battles, of shield walls and banners taken, of brothers standing shoulder to shoulder with each other in a battle. But what? There's more. We had pushed our oak blades into the surf for as long as we could remember, shoving them north and east towards the fields of Glenab. There, my brothers and I stood next to a copse of trees, a small copse of trees next to the fort there on the marshes of that great kingdom. We were told, my brothers of the gold star, we were told to hold this line. This was our land, and this is what we would pay in blood for. And in front of us, the Black Star's wolves lined up. Scudums pressed to Scudums, Black Stars and axes on their shields, and we could hear them coming. Their tramp of their feet shattering through the ground, through our feet into our bellies, and we knew in our dry mouths that they were coming, but silent and grim stood we, silent and grim, oath-bound to this land. Then their archers came, their wound beasts flying across the field between our lines, seeking battle honey for their hives, and men began to fall. And as they fall, our shoulders come together, our shields overlap, as we always do. Silent and grim stood we, silent and still, oath-bound to this land. And then in come their spearmen, long snake tongues shooting between our lines, shooting across the field, trying to take us from this life, trying to send us to Valhalla. And still we stood, silent and grim, silent and still oath-bound to this land. And as they came forward, the slaughter wall work began. Our battle ices licked and flipped through their lines, diving in, diving out as theirs did as well. Men began to fall, men began to drift off into Vol Hall or to the sidelines to drink beer. 
And still the lines came together. Still we stood silent and grim, silent and still oath bound to this piece of land that we had been given. And then the cry, the cry that freezes the blood of the men in the slaughter wall. Our allies, our brothers to our left had gone. There was nothing left of them. And from the throats of the Meridian warriors who were against us on that side, we heard the cry, Corona Volt, as they began to pour around our side. And we knew, looking between us, looking back and forth, making eye contacts, we knew that this was the end. And yet, out of the voice of kings, out of this tumult of battle, roaring over the sounds of armor and swords, we heard my prince's voice, Gunnar of Trimeris, Lord uh, in Goldstar, Knight of the Realm, roared out, Goldstar, to me. And half of our line rotated, turning to meet this new onslaught. The men in front of us, seeing this, began to move forward, and in a giant wave of black stars, thought that they would sweep us from the field, but like a cliff face, our line held. Our battle ice did work, did butcher's work, that was second to none that day. Behind us, we could hear the roar of battle. We could hear men falling. And we knew that in to Gunnar's side had come Flanagan, prince of the Stag's kingdom, and another brother in Gold Star. And they had joined together the Gold Star from the West, the Gold Star from Trimeris, and the Eastern kingdoms had joined together to face the Meridians as they came. And our work in front of us continued unabated. Men fell, men were wounded, and our wall became smaller and smaller, still screaming our war cries. Gold star, vivat Trimeris. And then suddenly, there was silence. None in front of us. No men, no warriors, brothers or sisters to fall. And so we turn, and we turn to go and aid our brothers behind us, go and aid our brothers of Gold Star as they themselves were embroiled in battle. And yet, there was no one there either. They had run the meridians into the ground. Nothing but bodies lay upon the field. At that moment, Prince's spears, Gunnar and Flanagan together, had supped deep of the meridian lines. A grisly supping had they made. Here at this copse of trees, three stars converged on this one piece of ground where we had stood silent and still grimly holding it. Three stars, the black star of Anstioras and Meridies, and the gold star of my own household. And at that moment, the gold star was the only one to rise. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was incredible and masterfully told really appreciate that very stirring i was spellbound all right so that was halk of the east atlantia alliance with a grizzly supping coming up next we have lord donalbane of blackmarsh followed by meister filippo lord donalbane of blackmarsh is of the middle alliance and he will be performing for us brendoken boys are you here I am here, my lady. Fantastic. Are we all ready to go? Very much so. Fantastic. And thank you so much. All and, and I must thank that uh, that noble scald who came before me, because uh, uh, because as he says, the gold star rose. 
I know a few things about gold stars myself, my lord. This is the, is the tabard heard of the barony of Brandoken. We are known throughout the Midrealm as one of the fiercest rapier her, her, her places in the entire Midrealm. And there are her enemies know that when you come to our line, the best strategy is to turn around and run. And I will tell a tale of how, how oh, this, this metal was proven on the Penzik battlefield field at Penzik 44, on the reign of the good King Ragbalder. In this particular fight, it was, it was one of the years where, uh, where the East and the Mid-Realm had actually the, thrown aside their differences and come together as an alliance. However, on that day, our, our forces were outnumbered by, by a good three to two. And our general who, who was, who was set to give us a task that would be he one that we would have to complete if the Mid-Realm was to win. This particular battle oh, was the manor battle. And the rules were that a banner had to be taken from the center of the field into the, about the opposition's manner and placed there for, there for victory. Five banners in total were brought out and they, how they had to be brought into the manor in order to score the points. Seeing in that we were outnumbered and home that we had, had, had what we had, our general oh, oh, gave a Brendoken a mighty task that day. He placed us on a line not 50 feet in front of the manor and told us in no uncertain terms that we were the last line of defense. Backed up only by a few of our friends from the, uh, from the Barony of Flaming Griffin, Brendoken boys, boys stood that day in, in line, knowing that we were going to be facing wave after wave of enemy combatants. Sadly, that is exactly what happened. 14 warriors buried her in this hunter and sable stood there her prepared her to face, face all that was coming at us. And what was coming at us first was, not, uh, was nothing to, uh, to be trifled with. No less than the Atlantean army coming out in full charge. Anyone, both rapier or armored, who has seen Atlantia charge knows what that means. We braced, we prepared. We were ready to, uh, to, uh, to die and hold that position and, and, and at any cost and, and Atlantia rolled into us with all they had. But I realized suddenly that it was not just myself. There were other brothers who would come forward and come, uh, came into our ranks and gave us even more spine. We held, held them there and pushed us the charge back. Atlantia sent rolling back onto the top of the field. But the Alliance was not dissuaded. In fact, this time they sent our old friends, our old enemies, our old, 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 old companions ends of the blade from the kingdom of Ethelmark straight at us. Ethelmark comes as they do, like a wave, a tsunami of red, of red coming straight for us. Once again, and Brando can, can prepare. Once again, we braced. And once again, we took the charge, suddenly realizing that so many of our friends had joined us. And we were able to oh, 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 push them back as we had at Atlantia before. At this point, the, East, all the enemies were getting very, very, very frustrated and held and Eldemir was her wanted their ch her charge and they hit us with everything they had. And still, there was no way through. Brando can, and was, and was being driven down, but we were, were being propped up by so many of our friends from the Midrealm. I heard on more than one occasion the general say, Brace that line, brace that line, until by the end of the fight, it was, brace that line, brace that line, and make certain Brandoken does not fall. A fourth charge came. All the bannermen and of all, the, all of our enemies came straight for us, but this time we would not be moved, and not only this time. This was nothing new to us. This time, we will not only take, uh, uh, take your charge, we will take your lives, we will take your pride, and we took their banners as well. Now, considering and that the banners were all ours, we handed them off to our, our mid-realm allies, but being outnumbered in this, uh, in this resurrection battle, we were unable to score any points, but so were our enemies, to the point where at the end of the, end of the fight, it was a draw. Now, King Rand Balder, being, uh, um, being in good, good and noble, changed the rules to, uh, to make it uh, uh, that 
it, there would have to be a winner of this battle. And in doing so oh, oh, he, oh, with the superior numbers of the enemy, he ensured that, or, or that unfortunately, the mid realm um, was going to die. And finally, I saw all, all that line break. And finally, I saw all, all those banners go oh, into, oh, into the manor. But it had been seen by some of the, of the finest warriors heirs of the mid realm, no less in authority than, oh, oh, than the great Master Chrétien, order of the, her defense, a master himself. He told King Ragvalter of our of our prowess that day, saying that and the charge after charge had come on to us. And it and every time the charges had come to us, they had broken like water on the rocks. On that day, Rand Oaken, Oaken earned the dragon's teeth, the highest, highest order, the highest award for valor on the field by a unit in the mid round. In honor of this, as I was in the front row of this, I composed a song to honor it. And it will, it will go forward that the Brandoken boys will have honor from this day. Us Brandoken boys, we haunt your every step. For each one closer to our line, your two steps nearer death. So we go. Enemies, beware. When the Pensic Wars start again, Randogan will be there. Honor and Sable. Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And with singing too, I really, really enjoyed that. That was truly special. All right. So thank you very much, Lord Donalbane. Coming up next, we have Maestro Filippo de Sancto Martino of the East Atlantia Alliance with the piece Cry Dagger Charge. Coming up after that, we have Baron Hagar the Black. So Maestro Filippo de Sancto Martino, are you ready? Thank you very much. Fantastic, thank you. All right, gonna hand the mic over to you. Take it away. This is a battle speech for Ethelmark. Welcome, dear brothers and sisters of Ethelmark, fellow children of the Escarbuncle. This day is blessed by your presence. The field is made more glorious by your ranks. It was not that long ago that we became a kingdom. We are the young. We are the upstarts. We are the wild Turks. We fight for our kingdom. We fight for our king and queen. We fight for those that inspire us and we fight for the sheer joy of it. I look around and I see skilled warriors. Some are epic heroes of the known world. I see splendid plate and chain. I see rows of shields and bows. I see ferocious spears, swords and axes too. I see before me the finest army in the known world. You are an impressive sight. But I ask you, does not the other side have the same? Is this enough to best our foes in the fields this day and bring honor to our lands? Is it enough? Well, it certainly does not suck. Yet, I do see something else. I see what makes us more than just the size of our force and the quality of our armaments. I see that which burns within all of you. It pumps through your veins, it fuels your actions. It is passion and I see it burn in each of you. Yes, passion, a powerful emotion, a strong desire, a boundless enthusiasm, passion. It was this passion that fueled Duke Morgan Sheridan to greatness with a weapon in his hands and a clearly audible giggle. It was the passion within Duke Christopher of York to do so many epic deeds. It was passion when he won the best of the best wearing barely enough armor to fit into his helm. He fought like a wild man and won that day for Ethelmar. It was passion that drove Duke Kylik to act as a human shield, allowing archer's mistress Zoe Acropolis to cut down the enemy close and personal. 
It was passion that fueled Baron Salim to clear a bridge single-handedly, charging and whirling a polearm like a windmill in a hurricane. It was passion that fueled Shiro no Kaminari to hold a bridge single-handedly with a wasasashi in each hand. It was passion when Master Otto Bass strapped a wounded arm into a sling and came to battle. With but one good arm strapped to a shield, he held the field and knocked the charging foes off that bridge. Passion. It was passion that fueled Sir Tristan Sextwolf to spear Duel to spear Duel on a bridge and best over 20 foes one at a time with only one arm. It was passion that fueled a young man to reach into a pile of broken weapons, pull out a 12 inch piece of broken sword, hold it up and declare dagger charge. It was passion that caused his three young friends to also reach into that pile of broken weapons, one at a time, find a broken sword, hold it up and declare dagger charge. It was that passion that caused them to toe the front line, brandish daggers and stare down the shield wall before them. When the warlord said to them, what the hell do you think you are doing? They looked him and to the man said, dagger charge. It was passion when the cannon went off and the youth charged the shield wall. It was passion when the man mountain shoved them with his glaive up and over the shield wall to chaos and glory. It was passion that led the leader of the dagger charge, not only to make it to the very back line of the enemy ranks with just a dagger, but eventually that passion, that passion would make him your king, his majesty Maynard von der Stein of Ethelmark. Passion, it fuels our heroes. It fuels our legends. It fuels each and every one of us. It burns within you, Ethelmark. As you stand in the ranks today, as you hear the drums and battle songs, as armor clinks and soldiers do chant, as you wait for the cannon to roar, remember this. Today is your day. This moment belongs to you. Glory is within your grasp. Grab it, seize it, and live within it. In the name of friends we have lost, in the name of friends who can no longer join our ranks, in the name of honor and in glory, in the name of Etherbark, the Escarbuncle and the Scarlet. Lay on my brothers and sisters, lay on. Today is your day, seize it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Passionate and rousing, indeed. Thank you, Maestro Filippo de Santo Martino, to, for giving us Cry Dagger Charge. Coming up next, we have Baron Hagar the Black of the East Atlantia Alliance, followed by Ulfar. Uh, Baron Hagar the Black, um, I do not have the name of your piece. Are you ready? I am. Fantastic. Can you please share with us the name of your piece? I have for you today a battle speech, which is entitled, What Were You Doing? Fantastic. Take it away. Thank you. What were you doing? This they loudly demanded of me, perhaps in outrage, or perhaps they thought that though my eyes are dimmed, so too perhaps my hearing. These young fools. Twas not so long ago to hold a sword beyond them lay, much less the hope to wield one. And I taught them, as I had taught their elder kin before them. Yet now to them I seem of no more use than moldy kitchen scraps. What were you doing? You heard this asked harshly of you as well when your folly was discovered. There is not to be learned from that old fool which shall avail you in the least. Another said, the weapons of war are ill-fitted to hands such as yours, not upon a battlefield, but in kitchen or bedchamber is where a woman is best found. Yet you gave no more heed to their prattle than to the braying of a mule, and for all their foolish stubbornness mules they might have been, for what arose was no mischief I devised. Twas you who grasped the brewing storm that arrogance would bring. 
Thus it was that you furtively sought me out to, to learn if there were befitting means I might impart your own protection to avail. Hence, I reveal to you means by which an enemy you might withstand, measures born not of strength alone, but of stealth and speed and skill which you possess. These things you took to heart and approved yourself pupils more apt than aught which I have known. Though I these lessons first did teach, it is in you that they have grown and now brought forth their fruit in full. Not only my teachings did you master, but even more for yourself have devised ways of greater subtlety and cunning than e'er I had imagined. And now our warriors are gone these three days to aggress the force that they learned was encamped to the west. All oh, turnips, a man with no more sight than mine could clearly see that this was but a feint to draw them out. And now revealed, of course, the real enemy that prepares to set upon us from the east at break of day. Hidden, you have seen their scouts skulking the woods, surmising that our town and land appear without defense or resource, the men drawn away by base deceit, and the women fled or hid away, consumed with fear and dread. And indeed, in hiding you shall be, yet not in fear, but in deadly ambush. You have learned well the art of concealment, so silently you shall watch as they advance, supposing that at hand are both the plunder of your belongings and the conquest of your bodies, yet altogether unaware of how close you are at hand. Yourselves have taught to move with silent swiftness, so that when your foe has passed, you shall close quietly in behind them, cutting off their escape. Then those in the rear shall begin to fall at your hands, and with such stealth that not even the man standing beside him shall know that the deed has been done until the same fate befalls him in the next moment. You have learned to lay traps, devious and cunning, which shall claim even more as they spread out throughout the town. Only then will they begin to realize that our home is not so easy a conquest as they had imagined. In that moment, further clouds of death and confusion will descend upon them from all directions, in the form of arrows and even stones from those of you whose skills with such weapons have been well honed. Finally, when those few who remain attempt to flee, they shall be cut down by you who know how to use a sword, and your victory shall be complete. Sisters in arms, tomorrow when the sun rises, you will face a challenge greater than any group of women as far back as can be recalled. But because of your commitment to your training, because of your indomitable courage, because of the strength of your hearts, you are far better prepared to meet this challenge than any group of men as far back as can be recalled. And when such of our fighters as may remain stagger home in the coming days and see what has transpired, in an attempt to salvage their wounded pride, they will demand to know, what were you doing? And heaven itself shall bear witness to the truth of what you shall answer. We have been doing what you could not, we have been saving our homes and indeed our very lives. And so on this day, so you shall. Thank you so much for that rousing and stern story. Absolutely spellbinding, fantastic. That was Baron Hagar the Black of the East Atlantia Alliance. Coming right up, we have Ilfar Guild here of the East Atlantia Alliance with the story Out of the Darkness. After Ulfar, we'll have King Damon. Now, Ulfar, are you here with us and are you ready? I am. Fantastic, so good to see you again. All right, I'm gonna hand the mic over and you can take it away. Thank you. Honored judges, esteemed competitors, lords and ladies, and all good gentles here assembled. I have been charged with writing a battle speech, stirring and inspirational. I struggled with this, trying to come up with a good idea. And it was given to me as a piece of advice from a well-known bard that what I should write is something that inspires myself. And if it inspires me, it will inspire others. 
And that is what I've done. So I now present to you my battle speech out of the darkness. Today, we stand on the edge of darkness. For far too long, we have remained in its shadow, wondering if we would ever again see the light. Each and every one of us carries the scars it has borne upon us. We have grieved and wept. We have fought and struggled. We have suffered and we have considered giving up. But we did not give up. And here today, we fight not just for victory, not just for glory and honor and acclaim. Today, we fight for hope. Today, as we step upon this battlefield, we bring with us the hope of light, the light of a new and brighter day, a day where we can once more stand shoulder to shoulder with our comrades in the shield wall, a day where weapons are raised and war cries echo like thunder, a day where at last the darkness is overcome. There are those who could not be here with us today, but hear my words, they are not forgotten. They live on in our memories and their spirits march beside us into battle for a warrior's spirit is eternal and burns bright in the hearts of their companions and in the tales of their glorious deeds. And for those of us here upon this field, today will be a day long remembered. Tales will be told in the feasting halls and around the bardic fires. Years from now, cups will be raised and tales will be told of the glorious deeds of this day. Tales that will be passed down from generation to generation. Tales of the valiant warriors who stood upon this field and of the brave heroes who fought to bring us here. Tales of the day that at last the dark was overcome and light returned to the world. Hear me, O oh warriors. Today, we stand on the edge of darkness. And today, we step forward into the light. Rise, O oh warriors. Unsheath your blades. Hold high your spears. Raise your axes. For today, we fight, we fight for hope, we fight for glory, we fight for honor, we fight for a new and a brighter day, a better day. For today, once more, we fight. Thank you. Wow, thank you so very much for that rousing and stirring battle speech. That was Ulfar of the East Atlantia Alliance with Out of the Darkness. Coming up next, we have King Damon Macmillan of Artemisia, followed by Soph of the Middle. King Damon is of the Western Alliance and will be performing for us battle story. King Damon Macmillan, are you here with us? Yes, I am. Fantastic. All right, are you ready to go? Okay, I'm ready. Let's go. All right, take it away. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the story I'd like to tell today is a, a story from a stray of war about 20, 20 or so years ago. Um, it's a story about a knight and a squire. Um, during one of the battles at this stray of war, we were fighting at what we affectionately called the donut of death battle. It was a battle scenario with a large mountain in the middle and you fought all the way around it so it looked like a giant donut with a donut hole cut out of it. Um, so this knight and the squire were on the far edge of one of the flanks, um, uh, flanks of guarding the flank of the far edge of this donut of death. Um, and uh, somehow these two men were responsible for guarding about a 50 foot stretch of the field. And across from them was the Lance, uh, the Lance Connect unit from the Kingdom of Aidenvelt. 
And they had about 50, 50 or so fighters in this unit. And their general, um, Sir Balin, tells them, we can hear him, or they can tell him, tell him keep this, this place. Don't, don't attack, don't retreat, just hold this location. And, and he leaves. So the knight and his squire are left there, just going like, um, there's two of us, there's 50 of them. This isn't going to go well. There's a small ditch in between. And they're just kind of standing there, just waiting for their inevitable doom when this large group of Lance Connects decides to run them over. Um, if you don't know the Lance Connects, wear very bright colors and a lot of feathers in their armor. It's amazing to, amazing to see them as a unit. Um, so after a minute or two, some of the Lance Connects start to go like, what? why are we standing here? Why, why don't we just mow over these, these two fire, this knight and this squire and attack this flank and we could be victorious and it will be awesome. So about a um, little six man fire team uh, attacks the knight and the squire and the dust kicks up and before they know it, the dust kicks up. There are feathers flying everywhere and the six men are laying dead on the ground. And the knight and the knight and the squire are standing there like, hey, hey, we, we got him. We we held that held that charge. We we did something, yay! And they see the Lance Connects look around. Then their seven man charge attacks and attacks this knight and this squire. And boosh, there's sand and dust everywhere. You, you can hardly see what's going on. Feathers start flying again. And then when the dust settles, those seven men are dead. So at this point, the young cocky squire starts just running his mouth about how there's no way they can defeat them to stay on their, their, their side of the ditch. This isn't going to go well for them. Just saying anything he can think of because he knows their doom is inevitable. Then they send a, a 10 man group, boosh. Sand kicks up, feathers are flying everywhere. You see bright colors everywhere. The knight is just crushing people with his, um, crushing the opponents with his sword and shield. And the squire is doing whatever he can with his spear and somehow defeat those 10 men. Then finally the knight and squire look, look at each other like, oh, what's going on? I don't know, but it's working. So let's, let's just keep this position. And then the Lance Connects send one more group of 10 men. Sand goes everywhere. Feathers are flying off of the Lance Connects armor and it's just, it's just going everywhere. And then the, the dust settles and it comes down and there's the Knight and the Squire still standing um, after defeating about 30 men. At this point, Sir Balin comes back from scouting the other side of the field and starts yelling at the 20, the 20 men left in the unit. No, I told you not to charge them. That's Basil and Damon. What are you guys doing? Goes this way. So instead of taking the last 20 men and charging the Knight and the Squire, they leave. And um, the Knight and the Squire are just left standing there just in shock and awe that it actually worked, that somehow they've held this, um, this flank, this 50 foot flank and came out victorious. Um, the the knight was my my knight duke, Sir uh, Basil de Drek, and I was the young arrogant squire at the time. And it was one of the one of my favorite personal war stories because it was there's no way we should have been able to do what we did. Um, thank you for letting me share with you, and I hope you all have a wonderful day. Oh, wow. Thank you so very much for that very colorful and featherful story. It's so amazing to hear about things that you've been involved with. That was King Damon Macmillan of Artemisia, the Western Alliance with Battle Story. Coming up next, we have Soph of the Middle Alliance with Carrie at the Bridge, after which we have Talson Phoenix. Soph, are you ready to go? Yes, I am. That is wonderful. All right. So please take it away whenever you are ready. Thank you. The call had come to join King Kellogg and Queen Vukasin in war. 
The dragon army traveled far to the south to aid their allies. The army of the dragon fought the enemy valiantly and slew many foemen, matching blow for blow with each battle. After many days of fighting, the time had come for the final push to ford a great river. It was there on that bridge that a true hero would emerge. In the first moments of fighting, King Kellogg was slain by an arrow. His royal bard, Sergeant Kari Garan Hirson, part of the royal personal guard, was hit by arrows himself, first in his arm, then his leg. Flight fallen, he lay next to his dead liege lord, knowing he would soon be slain himself. But great was the strength of Kari, like a Beowulf of old. A pause fell on the armies as they regrouped. Kari crawled to the middle of the bridge where both armies faced each other. Dane axe in hand, he challenged the enemy's shield wall, calling out, is there but one among you who will face me in combat that I may slay them? or that I may die and enter Odin's hall. None answered. Again, he challenged the line. Are you cowards that you would hide behind your shields? Come forth with your spear and I will grant you a man's death. <laughs> None came forth. For a third time, he called to the enemy. Is there no knight among you brave enough to give me passage to Valhalla? None came forth. Then the order came for the enemy line to move forward. They began to march towards Kari, who was kneeling, dirty, bloodied in the middle of the bridge. This valiant son of the dragon, he called out to them, I'll give you one more chance that one of you, brave at heart, give me single combat. But take one step closer and I'll consider your whole line engaged with me. The enemy line continued their march toward him. Kari called out, as none of you will meet me in honorable single combat, I must slay you to a man. At this, the line halted, a hush fell upon the bridge. No one moved. Then, with a roar, the dragon army fell upon the enemy in a mighty charge. The foe tried to repel the assault, but all were slain. As any foe came near him, Kari lashed out, slashing them with his mighty axe, until he finally fell to a spear hit, and the Valkyries claim, came to claim him. None knew how many foemen brave Kari slew that day. I thought it was 12, but now I hear that it was a hundred lives claimed, each with a single blow of his ax. So the dragon army and their allies won the day. And that evening, there was a celebration of the might of Kari, son of the dragon. Thank you so much, Soph. That was Soph of the Middle Alliance with Kari at the Bridge. Truly stir stirring and very exciting. Coming up next, we have Telson Phoenix of the East Atlantia Alliance with Ath Firdiath, followed by Baroness Amani. All right, Telson, are you here with us? I am. Fantastic. Is your video on, my lord? It is. There you are. Fantastic. All right. The mic is yours whenever you are ready to go. Please take it away. Thank you. Folks, I am Taliesin Phoenix, and this is a tragedy, as all battle stories are. When I was young, quite young, I had the honor of serving as the spear carrier for a great warrior. His name was Kuholan. And he and his brother, Ferdiad, fought together 
were raised together, learned together at Scythe's knee on the Isle of Skye. And they together earned great arms in their trials. Ferdiad, an armor of horn which no weapon could pierce. And Cuhullin, the great Gebulga, a great and terrible spear which always found its target and left 50 exit wounds for every time it pierced its enemy. Now, many years after their training and after they had parted as brothers, not in blood, but blooded, Queen Maeve launched an attack in the great cattle raid of Cooley from Connacht to Ulster to capture the great bull of Cooley, which she was denied in trade and denied in marriage, she took by force, she thought. With all of the men of the Red Branch laid up sick, it lay to just Cuhulin to hold the river that stood at the boundary between Connacht and Ulster. So I went with him in his chariot as he drove to hold the spear, the great Gebulga, while he fought, for he would use it against no man. For he was compassionate, though the greatest of all warriors. And we reached the river, and we reached the ford, and he stepped out of the chariot and walked to the center, and I followed. And at his command, I took the great spear and I planted it into the bed of the river. Upstream of where he stood and the river parted around the Gebulga and parted around his legs and he stood at peace and waited for the armies of Connacht to reach the eighth Ferdiad, though that was not yet what it was called. Now, with the armies of Connacht came many, many fighters and many warriors, and with them came Maeve herself in her chariot of gold, and with them came all the champions of Connacht, and with the champions came Ferdiad, brother of Cuhullin, and bearer of the horned armor which no weapon may pierce. And though they had sworn as boys to never fight, and they hoped to avoid it in this fight, they both knew that there was a chance. And so Ferdiad hung back, for Cuhullin could not. He was alone in the river. Maeve, thinking to easily overcome him, sent forth her soldiers, sent forth her armies, sent forth into the river every man of Connacht. And Cuhullin, with tears in his eyes and no blade in his hand, broke them upon his fists and broke them upon his knees and their blood ran downstream as fast as the water of the river itself. And they fell, and they fell, and they fell, and Cuhullin wept. And at the end of the first day, with hundreds of her soldiers fallen at the hands of the greatest warrior ever to live, Maeve despaired. How could this be, she thought. And so she went to the ford where Cuhullin stood, still at peace. And she said, Cuhullin, you earn much renown for yourself in slaying these common soldiers mocking him and Cuhullin, not rising to the bait simply replies i do not come for honor for i have plenty i come for duty and mave inf infuriated replies then you will face my champions 
Each will come, and you will be slain, for you cannot stand against the greatest fighters in the world, the champions of Kanak. And Cuhulin stood at peace, calm. Let them come. And he held his place in the river that night, unmoving, downstream from the Gebulga. And I kept vigil with him on the Ulster side of the river, on the bank, waiting. And I held my breath. For the next morning, the first of the champions of Connacht came, and he drew his mighty sword, and he held his great javelin. And before he even approached the bank or wet his boots, the javelin flew. And Cuhullin, performing his great salmon leap, sprang from the water and landed atop the flying javelin and ran along its surface, kicking it up and catching it in his hand and throwing it back at the champion square in his chest, and so the champion fell. And the tale repeated again and again and again, each champion making their best attempt, but Cuhulin was unstoppable. He was great. He was powerful. And he was not to be moved. And at the end of the second day, Maeve despaired. For she knew that Ferdiad would not fight Cuhullin, for they were brothers, and all knew that they had sworn never to face one another. But she had a plan. And so she called Ferdiad to her tent that night, and Ferdiad, being wise, knew why she called for him. And so he walked into her tent, and she offered him wine, and he took it and said, I will not fight my brother. And Maeve, quietly, said to herself, That's what he said. He knew you would not come. And then she sipped her wine. Ferdiad stopped, paused, not believing that his brother would say such a thing, but why would Maeve, his queen, lie? What do you mean by that, he demanded. And Maeve said, well, Cuhullin simply said, that you both knew that he was the greater warrior, and so you would be afraid to face him. Ferdiad was blinded by his rage. And so he told Maeve that he would challenge Cuhullin, and he would prove that he was as great. And Maeve smiled, for she knew that Ferdiad could not be harmed by any weapon. And so the next morning, Ferdiad marched to the river bank. And Cuhulin wept, seeing his friend coming. Adorned in the horn armor which could not be pierced, and Cuhulin, knowing he would never raise the Gebulga to his friend, knew that they must stalemate. And as they reached for their swords, Ferdiad for the first time, and Cuhulin for the first time, the rasp, as they came from the scabbard, was loud enough to rattle all the kingdoms. And so they fought, and they fought, and they swung, and try as he might, Cuhullin could not put a mark upon Ferdiad, but Ferdiad had much better luck. Ferdiad struck again and again at Cuhulin, cutting him deeply over and over and over again. And finally, in desperation, Cuhulin leapt in his great salmon leap, preparing to bring his sword down into the head of his brother. And Ferdiad saw it coming. He knew that Cuhulin would try the salmon leap, and so he crouched, and his sword came up and stuck deep into the body of Cuhulin, deep into his chest, and Cuhulin fell beneath 
the water. And Ferdiad, believing his friend, his brother, his blood slain, began to weep. But a hand thrust out of the water and grasped the shaft of the Gebulga upstream and pulled it free of the river bed and Cuhulin rose from the water and grasped the great spear and thrust it through the horn armor of Ferdiad. And Ferdiad cried out, but that cry was nothing compared to the scream as the head of the gay bulga exploded. Out of Ferdiad, 50 wounds for every thrust, and Ferdiad was slain. And Cuhulin wept and broke the gay bulga over his knee and picked up the broken shattered body of his brother and buried him at the ford with the great spear and that is how i saw the naming of the ath fear the ad, the ford of fear the ad. Thank you so much for that truly transportive experience. What a tale. Thank you so much. That was Tales in Phoenix of the East Atlantia Alliance with Athfirdiath. Coming up next and rounding us out for the top of the hour, we have Baroness Amani Mashal Al Sabdi, also of the East Atlantia Alliance, with Atlantia Battle Speech. Baroness, are you here? I am here, yes. That is fantastic. Are you able to turn your video on? I am doing that, yes. Hold on. Wonderful. So good to see your face. Thanks. All you. right. And looking forward to your performance today. Please take it away whenever you are ready. All right. I am doing a battle speech for Atlantia and her allies. However, my speech does not come to you about other wars that we have participated in, other wars that we have won or lost, other wars that are so impressive, so meaningful, that are so impactful, not just on our minds, not just on our memories, but on our bodies as well, because you can feel the might of the armor crashing, whether you're in the fray or whether you're on the sidelines. Instead, my tale is of this bardic war. I want to inspire you about this entire experience. So my battle speech comes to you about this event that we are currently in, this contest of brothers and sisters. Before me, I see my countrymen and women, courageous, brave, righteous, and true. I am humbled to stand before you, to see your bright light and to bask in the glowing warmth of your love. To my right and to my left, I see our allies, all of you most worthy to fight for our mutual and noble cause. You are welcomed and embraced in brotherhood and sisterhood, invited to share in the tales and the deeds made by this mighty alliance that will surely live in history. For tales of this day and all the days of this merry conflict will indeed be told round the fire in the feast halls and at tables in all places where our brethren shall meet and share words. I say that even our foes who began this conflict with their ill-fated attempt at seizing our finest, will share stories of our mutual battles and bardic contention. Let not this bardic war make you weary. Do not hesitate to engage in the fray. Muster your courage and your voice and loudly proclaim, I am for Atlantia. 
Use your voice as your shield and your words as your sword in song, poetry, music, and tales. Make your instruction and your aid your arrows and barrage those who will contest us until they cry defeat. Words of your power will make these familial enemies shudder and whimper, bemoaning the day they sought to war with mighty Atlantia and her fierce allies. Ready your prose. Tune your strings of your sharpest instruments. Prepare your mental muscles. Quiver in readiness like battle-ready war horses and trample your opponent in every contest. Smack down your foe with gauntlets of steely words. Let them not draw breath between your barrage of bardic fire. Let them know we are the best our mutual society has to offer and make them weary, yet eager to engage in battle with us again. But now here, in this moment, make them cry mercy. Make them cry vivat, 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 Atlantia. Thank you. Thank you so much. What a stirring Atlantia battle speech. And what a way to have a high note to the ending of this amazing competition. That was Baroness Amani Masha'al al-Sabti of the East Atlantia Alliance with Atlantia battle speech. I have to say, I am so impressed with the caliber of everybody here. Thank you so much for your efforts, time, and attention to your stories, your, your storytelling abilities, and coming to the first Bardic War. It would be nothing without you. So thank you all so very, very much. I'm truly honored to have had any small part in this. So that was our total list of competitors. You all did fantastic. And I do not envy the judges their decision. And that concludes our competition for the Battle Speech and Storytelling War Point. And I hope you all had a wonderful time. I certainly enjoyed watching it.